Welcome back to another episode of The Power of Your Story, a space for people to share their story, learn from their story, and ultimately empower others through that story. Today's guest in today's episode that I wanted to have with all of you revolves around this concept of success. I believe, well, I'm not going to project my own meaning on whether or not you're striving for success or not. I think that's for each and every single one of us to decide but more so, what does success look like in our lives? And are we or are we not getting closer to it, away from it, or anything in between? Today's guest, his name is Dr. Eric Rees. Him and I just had a phenomenal conversation on the other podcast called Overcoming Odds. So if that's something you're interested in, please feel free, feel free to tune in in the upcoming weeks as that episode will be put together and released to the rest of you. But before we get started with this episode, just wanted to make one quick announcement, and that is if this is your first time tuning in or if this is your second or fourth or 20th time tuning into this particular podcast, please consider supporting our show by either leaving us a review on Facebook or LinkedIn. That would help us tremendously in spreading the message even more that we're trying to create around this concept of story or one's personal narrative. And with that said... Let's please welcome Dr. Eric Reese onto the show. There he is. We are back for another <laughs> <laughs> intro. I was I'm pumping behind the scenes, so I don't know if anyone will be able to see that, but that was great. Yeah. No, I appreciate you. I appreciate you for being a part of it. Um, there's something to be said, I think, when you connect with other people of similar synergies and similar mission in life. And I think that when you and I connected first, I was able to sense that. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I think there is much to explore when it comes to this concept of success to begin with. And um, I figured that the best way that maybe we can even approach this topic is exploring it through the lens of what does success mean to you in knowing what you know today? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, success is a relative term. Um, I've, I've had the... Uh, there is there's, uh, some feedback that's coming from the microphone and I'm wondering if it's mine or yours. Do you want to keep talking? Can you hear it when I do it? It, it I think it's coming from yours. Let me just try and see the mic here. Mm -hmm. Talk about success, right? Success of audio. <laughs> Successful audio. Do you want to I can switch the microphone that I'm using if that yeah, works easier works for you. Mm -hmm. Let's go with Let's try this one. Is that better? That's perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Better for you? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Well, speaking Talk about of success, <laughs> you got to make mistakes to reach success. That's for sure. That's how we have to look at it. I think it's a relevant uh, question. And, and, you know, case in point, um, things don't always go according to plan. Um, if you would have asked me what success looked like when I was 20, I would have given you a different perspective than what success looks like when I was 30. And being 33 now, my version of success just inherently will look different as well too. I think that the older that I get, the more I realize that success to me really means finding what I'm passionate about. And, and especially for my values and my value system, it's really about helping people. Um, yeah. You know, I got into medicine and I got into understanding neuroscience and psychology because I love people. I think that they're so fascinating. And if you've ever been to any public outing, you know, people watching is part of the fun. If for me, it's most of the fun. I love seeing what people do, what they choose to do, what they choose not to do, whether they choose to engage or not engage socially. Um, there's so many facets with that. And um, I think success for me at the end of the day can kind of come down to a couple of things. One, you know, what's my impact? Um, I, I don't want to be 
known around the world. I don't want to be having a large following or social status for who I am. I want to, I want the things that I work with or the people that I work with to have a positive outcome as a result of that, whether they're living a more fulfilling life, whether they are making more money, they're a part of the, some of the companies we're creating, things like that. That to me is what success is. And the way you get that is by having your success outlast you. I, I have a you know, due date for the lack of a better term. And I don't know what date that is. In some way, shape or form, I hope that what I'm working towards and what I'm doing will outlive that. And it's not about having a statue or being named after by a school. It's more so how can the effect that I'm having today have a greater effect on people long term when I'm no longer around? And so I think that there are multiple ways to go about it. Sure, we all want to be financially fit. We all want to be professionally uh, successful. You know, want to have a, a good spouse or a good partner in life, um, travel the world, things like that. But, uh, you know, those things won't happen if you don't really align yourself with your values and your beliefs. And that's where a lot of people get caught and static and friction is, you know, they're, they're doing one thing, uh, but, but another, they're, they're not aligning with, with, with themselves and their values on another. For instance, let's say you got a new job and you're making, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year. Well, great. You just met a large financial goal. You're successful in that realm. But what if you are now all of a sudden having a really hard time maintaining friendships in mm-hmm. your, your, your wife no longer wants to spend time with you because you're not that much fun to be around. I mean, that's considered a failure, but you're successful in one realm versus the other. And, there are a lot of people who find themselves in that. So um, I think it's so individualized and you have to find that through life experience too. When did that make sense to you that this concept of success is completely up into interpretation depending on who is approaching that concept or trying to answer that question to begin with? Yeah, I, that's a difficult date for me to say, even like from a perspective of in my life, because I've kind of always been surrounded by people who come from varying backgrounds and different beliefs. Um, I'm very fortunate that my parents put me in those situations, playing sports and meeting their friends and having conversations with people who I, you know, were outside of my circle. They weren't my, always my age. They were older than me. They had different experiences and different, you know, life factors that, that were taken into that whole equation. Um, I, inherently come from a large family. My mom is one of eight. I have 28 cousins on my mom's side alone. We are just a massive chaotic family, right? But we love each other and we are all different. And that's that's a very early life experience that I took um, and really own is the fact that I I can see why people can relate to different people. And I think that's beautiful. I think that when we get to a situation that we're in today where we're so polarized and people are being pulled apart and you know, falling into different camps where all the beliefs are the same, we really start running into a lot of issues very quickly because we're so polarized and it's, it's all or none. It's a yes or a no. Yeah. The hard part for me is that the brain isn't binary. So our decision-making shouldn't be binary, even for health decisions, even for business decisions. It's not binary. There's multiple right answers. So, um, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate that most of my life I've been surrounded by opportunities to learn and realize that, not all of us are created equally. Not all of us will look at success as equally as, as the other. And that's a very good thing. I, I appreciate diversity um, from that component. And like I know you, you do too. Mm-hmm. Someone had mentioned to me, this was maybe a couple months to a year ago, they had said that um, people help people. And I found that to be such a fascinating concept for a couple of reasons. First, I think when I looked at, at the initial sentence, I realized that as much as I wanted to, and there definitely were chapters of my life where I wanted to achieve things on my own or prove to myself that I can do it. And I did to a degree, but I I ran into a lot of walls. I I ran into a lot of and legitimate walls, things that that I truly couldn't get through on my own. And in realizing that people help people or maybe people need people, there's something to be said about finding my own unique abilities and being able to bring that to the table as well as creating a space at the table for you to do that. I do believe in a similar thing as you described. We're all unique and we all have our own different ways of looking at the world. And that's awesome. I truly wouldn't want to be in the world where everyone sees the same exact thing that I'm able to see. It would be very difficult for me to grow. I think there's that's a lot so of power. Boring too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of power in creating, yeah. in being a part of a space like that where I could see 
a variety of perspectives. And whether or not I agree with some or disagree with others, I think that's a topic for a different conversation. But if anything, it expands my perspective. It helps me understand that, okay, I viewed success this way five years ago, and that's okay because it served me back then. But here's another way based on another person's perspective of what success could be moving forward. Yeah. Well, it always reminds me of the quote. I think it's a Voltaire quote. Uh, Find those who seek the truth, but beware of those who found it. And I, I love that because it carries so many different connotations. Um, for me directly in medicine, I tell patients all the time, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you my professional opinion. Go get another one. Go get another one. Like find doctors who disagree with what is going on with you to understand their thought processes. I mean, I don't want you to run into a roadblock, but you know, sometimes we take for granted people of authority who, you know, they give us these opinions. They're not always right. If I'm still practicing medicine the way we were practicing medicine in the 90s, there are a lot of malpractice issues that are going on right now because docs have not adopted to new guidelines, um, new ways to look at different types of diseases, pathologies, even treatment and rehabilitation. So we have to be evolving. And that's the beauty of being you know, a human is, is we, we have evolved. We've changed over time. You know, We're no longer wearing bell bottoms, although yeah. some people might, might want to go back to those days. And who knows? Fashion does repeat itself at times. Um, so there's, there's so many different things to take into consideration with that. And one of the conversations that you and I were having earlier too about this is that we are told that we need to have it all figured out. And I battle with that every day. I still think I need to have everything figured out, where I'm going to be in five years, what I'm going to be making, what I'm going to be working on, all that stuff. And sometimes sitting back on that, and this is one of the reasons why you know, habits are so important is you have to sit back and really contemplate. Do, do you need that answer to move forward? You don't. And, and sometimes it's more fun that way. What if, mm-hmm. what if you were handed everything that you wished for, but you were never granted the things that you didn't wish for or didn't even know were possible. And those possibilities and those things you never wished for were way more exciting and way more fulfilling for you than the things you actually wished for. That's yeah. kind of a blessing in disguise. So, um, I hope all my dreams don't come true because what if there's something even better than what I'm dreaming that comes true in my life? That's a reality for, for, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. We, um, we think linearly and and I think that's why a lot of people struggle financially, right? Like why would I put $5 in today and do that for the rest of the month and a year off? So compound interest is what the seventh or eighth one of the world is, is Warren Buffett says. So there are so many components with how we think and from a psychological standpoint, how we go about, um, you know, understanding this and success is just, you know, whatever you define it as. And hopefully it changes over time uh, because if it doesn't, then you're, that means that you're not growing, you're not changing, you're not adapting. And realistically at the end of the day, um, you're not living the life that you could be living. And I think that's where a lot of people sadly will find themselves is that if they're not trying to challenge their status quo, they find themselves stuck. And that's a really tough spot to get out of unless you have some inspiration or people that you've surrounded yourself by who will help you kind of get out of that rut. Mm -hmm. Slight tangent from the, or maybe it's a tangent, maybe not, who knows. But in regard to the linear patterns in life, is that a conditioned way of thinking? Is that something that has been influenced through whoever or whatever, or is there actual theory behind that's how our brain processes information? Yeah, there. So there are a couple of questions, a couple of answers with that. Um, one, I mean, you have different types of like parallel processing within the brain. Um, and so there are different components of, you know, let's say we're reading a story, you know, you have a start in the middle and an end, you have different components that you need to hit. But think about it this way too. If you and I are trying to solve um, a math problem, that's a very different problem than you and I are trying to solve a cultural or a diversity problem. You know, there are different aspects in areas of thought that need to be involved in that, but um, they're, they're different processes to begin with. And so once again, the beauty of the brain and psychology is that there are a lot of theories that have been proven and then later disproven when we find out more and more about how our mind works and how we think and how we, we use different areas of our brain. And, you know, for all those multitaskers out there who think they're getting so much done by, uh, you know, writing a novel and also doing a crossword puzzle, you you might not like what the new research shows, which is multitasking is just you doing multiple tasks sequentially after each other and wasting a lot of the cognitive bandwidth. Um, So 
you know, there are theories and things that we thought that we knew and we're finding out that we really didn't know. And now we don't really know as much. And I think the older that I get and the more that I get into understanding people, the less I really feel like I really know. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, things that I laid down as this is a law or this is a model um, continuously get to become shattered. And that, that's a good thing. I like that. I, I like that. I get challenged every day. I love, I love working, you know, clinically with patients. I love building companies where I can help serve more patients. I think that there's so many ways to overlap those skill sets. And, you know, with this whole conversation about success, I'm still trying to figure out what I want to be when I get older. And I don't know if I will ever have a full answer for that. And I hope I don't. I hope that I'm continuously trying to reinvent myself because I think that's fulfilling and my interests will change. I think that when I have kids, uh, my interests will inherently change. I think when I have, um, you know, companies that have done different things within the mental health and wellness space, I will have, you know, different ways I want to go about with spending the rest of my life. And so um, at the end of the day, I know one thing. And that, that one thing for me is that I want to give back to humanity. And I want to help serve people to the fullest extent possible in whatever way, shape, or form that looks like. I'll spend the rest of my life trying to figure that out. And hopefully, it'll keep evolving over time with that too. Why is that important to you? You know, that's a great question. I was the kid who was younger, who like loved collecting bugs. Like, you know, you know, when you're like in first grade and everyone's playing soccer and you're like this little hub of humans running around a soccer ball. <laughs> when the soccer ball was like going this way, like I was like the random kid who was going the opposite way, like chasing after like a <laughs> butterfly. Like I was, um, I was unique to say the least. I I've always just been intrigued by the question of why, like, like what was going on? W like, why are, why are we here? Why, why are we, place in these different situations, personally, professionally, psychologically, and what are the challenges ahead of us? How can we overcome them? I think that being alive is one of the greatest gifts that we we can possess. And um, I want to live my life to the fullest extent possible. And through that, I want to help as many people as possible because it's, it's, it's the most fulfilling way to live your life, to help another, even if it's just one life, even if there's one life that's changed in this conversation. You have no idea about the ripple effects that could occur because of that. And that's very powerful. And once again, it comes back to that compound interest or that compound reaction that we really take for granted is, you know, we, we base our social media following off of how many followers we have. But you have no idea how many of those followers actually listen to you every day. You have no idea how many of those followers actually listen to the advice you're giving. And if one of them takes that advice and goes off and does something amazing with their life, you know, indirectly or directly, you may not know about it. And so when you can intentionally try to have a positive influence on humanity, on people's quality of life, their thought process, business, finance, whatever it's going to be, that's a life worth living. And that's a life where at the end of the day, if I'm on my deathbed, I can look back and say, you know, I don't really have regrets about doing that. Mm -hmm. Would you be satisfied if that only life that you could impact was yours? <sighs> that's a really good question. Um, I'm going to inherently give you my doctor answer, my doctor <laughs> answer, because I'm really good at giving these now. You know, I, I would say that if I've impacted my own life, I indirectly have impacted others because family members, friends, people that I know, inherently you're going to rub off on other people. You are, um, you know, the, the, we'll call it the manifestation, or you are the qualities of those five people who are closest to you, right? So mm -hmm. I'm a big believer of that. I surround myself with people who keep me honest, who help me grow, who help um, tell me no, which I think sometimes is so important instead of just saying yes. And they help kind of guide me. They're, they're the bumpers on my bowling lane that, you know, I'm the bowling ball mo moving through life and they help kind of guide me to make sure that I'm, I'm doing as much as I can. So I would like to say that my life would be enough. I think that there are so many other lives out there that we can all have an effect on. And even if I had a positive effect on my life through me growing and changing and challenging all of this, I like to think at the end of the day that will affect other people indirectly as well too, as a result mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. The only reason why I asked that is because I think for me, for quite some time in the earlier chapters of my life, I was so focused on impacting other people. And what I realized myself doing was that there were so many situations where I was trying to give something that I didn't have myself. Sure. I was trying to create spaces for people to be seen, to be heard, to be appreciated and all these other things. And yet I wasn't experiencing them myself. And I realized that what if that concept of 
be the change, change, you know, change someone else's life? What if that actually simultaneously implies change your life? Well, and that's leadership too, right? Mm -hmm. That's leadership 101 is you creating future leaders out of your ability to be a leader, right? Good leaders will create future leaders. Good yeah. leaders will help guide people and mentor individuals. And I think there's an important caveat with what you had just mentioned too, is the fact that you don't want to be giving, 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 and not receiving indirectly. Because if, you're, if your glass is empty, you can't fill anyone else's glass. And I see people do this all the time, right? So you're a powerful executive. Let's say you are trying to get your health back in track. Let's say you're trying to re, you know, recalibrate a relationship and you're not filling your cup, but you're trying to fill other people's and you're exhausted, you're fatigued. It's, it's affecting you negatively. Um, if you don't have a chance to recover, how do you expect anyone else to? And that's a yeah. very difficult thing to have happen. So there's a time and a place always, right? In some relationships, personally, professionally, whatever. Sometimes you'll have to give more than you receive. And in other seasons of your life, you will be receiving far more than you can give. And there's always going to be a two-way street with that. Um, and there's no right answer, right? Mm -hmm. Once again, coming through with how education in school and how we inherently go about with our education system, we're taught that there are right answers and wrong answers. And in life, absolutely, there are situations with that. Don't go walk in front of a moving bus. That's definitely yeah. going to be the wrong answer, right? You're not going to get you're not going to get a good answer out of that. You're not going to get far. <laughs> at the same time, too, right? With your career, with relationships, with taking calculated risks, with trying new things, you just have no idea what's going to come from that. And one of my favorite books of all time is a book called Range by David Epstein. And David Epstein is a former writer for like ESPN Sports Illustrated magazine, and he talks about how there is such a significant difference between specialization versus early life sampling. So he uses the example of Tiger Woods, early specialization. Earl Woods grew up golfing with Tiger in his garage. Tiger has been golf since the day he could walk. And he came to be one of the greatest golfers of all time, arguably. Well, very different than Roger Federer. Roger Federer grew up multi-sport athlete. His mother was a tennis coach, never influenced him to play tennis. He just grew up organically and, and became, you know, arguably one of the greatest tennis players ever. And he's still a reigning champion even in his later years of life. And what they're uncovering is that this early specialization, not only within sport, but within life, can be very detrimental to long-term effects for us structurally, psychologically, and emotionally. Because if you don't have an opportunity to sample many things throughout your life, you'll never know what you're good at. What if you started off, or let's say, take me for instance, let's say my parents wanted me to be a professional basketball player. And here I am, 5'10", uh, you know, a buck 50 in high school. There's no way I'm going to get drafted to play D1 ball. There's no way I'm going to make it to the NBA. And plus, if I don't have a passion for it, it they're just literally torturing me from a standpoint of not allowing me to feed my interests. Mm -hmm. And so it's so, I think it's so important for us to understand that where you're interested in where you're guiding your therapies, modalities, ideas, thoughts, beliefs today might be different in five years. And that's a really good thing. That means you're evolving and changing and you're sampling. And you have a large range of ideas and experiences that you can take and use to your benefit into the future when you find something that you're truly passionate about. How did you figure that out in your own journey, what you're passionate about or what your interests were? A lot of trial and error. <laughs> That's the easiest way to put it. Um, you know, like I said, I've always been curious. I've always, I felt like, you know, for my early part of my life, I really wanted to kind of fit in. I wanted to be a part of friends and relationships of what people were doing and what was popular and, and, and do all that. And the older that I get, the more I realize that being unique is a very large asset that I, that I carry and that I have. Um, I, didn't go to college with a lot of my friends that went to the same colleges. I, you know, I moved, I moved to Portland, Oregon, not knowing anybody off the whim that I was going to chase my career and go specialize in neuroscience and join a clinic that I knew nobody. I, I've chased and I've taken some calculated risks in, inherently for better, for worse that have really guided me and, and changed the way that I look at things, I guess. And so I think that um, you know, I would never say I'm better than anybody. I think I'm just different. And I think that's a unique thing that allows you to take on those risks and to have the confidence to be like, yeah, let's try this and see what works. Um, I don't inherently think that I am a natural risk taker on some of those fronts, but when it comes to business or when it comes to helping people, I'm more than apt to take a, take a hit to try and see if it works because 
at the end of the day, um, I'm willing to throw my ego aside to try and see what else I can do with this mm-hmm. life. And if I get taken out tomorrow, um, at the end of the day, I want to tell, be able to say that I live my life without regrets. And I think that's a really powerful way to go about it. Um, I'm not perfect and I never will be, but that won't stop me from trying to pursue as much as I can to, to accomplish with that. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge believer, as you can tell by the name of the show and everything that I'm doing in this concept of a story. I think that in my opinion, and just based on my experience, much of my own journey started with a story. And it was a story that I, as you said, continue to evolve, but I continue to believe in. And, and however many years down the road, here I am doing all of this. But it all started with that narrative and understanding what is the story that I'm telling myself, whether it's about success or who it is that I am, how I show up in the world, how I contribute to the lives of others. And so I'm curious to hear from your point of view and the perspectives that you've had in your own life, what is a story that you continue to believe about yourself that continues to be true from one chapter to another, or, or as you mentioned earlier, from one season to another? What is, what is that narrative that it's always within that no matter what, you always fall back to? Now, that thing might also evolve. I'm sure it does. But there's got to be a grain of truth to it. I think at the end of the day that we are all limitless. I would say that's probably one of the underlying factors of why I continue to do what I do. And whether that is psychologically, whether that is you know, financially, any accomplishment you want to make in life, I think that we all have an inherent ability to continue to pursue excellence and I don't want to use the word perfection, but trying to be a better version of ourselves for for it for eternity. For however long you were placed and your timestamp is, is set to be to be here on, on earth um, doing doing what you do. Um, neurologically that that holds true. There's a lot of underlying principles that have vastly changed since the 60s and 70s where we thought that the brain you develop and you grow and then you're, you're stuck with these, this amount of neurons and you're, that's, that's just what you're going to be. You're, you're you and you, you got to enjoy that and then just be you. Well, now we, we know too much now. We know that the brain is always changing. We know that there are areas of the brain where you can develop new cells, new neurons in the central nervous system in your brain, specifically in your hippocampus. Um, you know, there are so many new things that we've uncovered too, as far as how the brain changes over time. We know that physical exercise and challenging yourself and continuously learning things is one of the best ways for you to hold off any neurodegenerative disease coming towards you outside of taking care of your brain and body with nutrition, exercise, sleep, things like that too. There's, there's no, there's no secret pillar. There's no secret formula. It's a combination of so many things and, um, brains change. So for me, I take a look at that and I say, well, if brains change, brains can change for better, but brains can also change for worse. Yeah. It's kind of like the the flip side of the coin, right? You know, neuroplasticity is the name of the game with, with how brains change. And that works for better and that works for worse. For worse, in a standpoint, let's say you have pain. Let's say you have a little pain in your thumb. And over days, weeks, months, this pain gets worse and worse and worse. And now you have pain in your pain in your hand. Now it's pain in your arm. Now it's pain up all up, up throughout your shoulder. That's your brain changing and rewiring neuroplastic networks in your brain and your central nervous system. That's for worse. You don't want to have pain, right? And this is a problem with phantom limb pain, with depression, you know, neuropsychiatric conditions. The brain is literally rewiring and laying down new foundational systems and new foundational networks that tell you this is the way that it is. So we have to look at that from the flip side and say, how can you use that to your advantage? That's what you do when you're learning. That's what you're doing when you're challenging your thoughts. That's when you do when you realize that you were wrong on something and you have to correct that that error in your thought process. And this is something that's pretty scary now is that I can do a Google search on any topic that I want to, and I can inherently find something that will reinforce my bias. Mm-hmm. And this is what's really interesting with algorithms with all the social media platforms is you will start finding algorithms in people's news feeds that will support your ideas and your beliefs. And they know that because now you feel like you're a part of a community. Now you want to have more dopamine hits. You want to know, yes, this is the right way to think about things. This is the right way to go about finding success. And until you challenge that belief, you have no idea whether you're right or wrong. And so you can spend your entire life thinking that you are this, but you're actually that. And that's a scary part to be. So I am always trying to put myself in vulnerable situations speaking, you know, having conversations with people, challenging my thoughts, 
building companies, that's not easy. The, you know, like I have a kind of a great idea, but at the same time too, if nobody wants it, you know, I'm not going to spend any more time trying to reinvent the VCR because nobody wants yeah. it, right? We're all Google now, right? <laughs> Even Bluetooth. Bluetooth was a phenomenal invention, uh, you know, when it when it came about and mastering the DVD. And, and now it's, you know, you don't want Bluetooth anymore. Everything's on Netflix and, and Hulu and, and Prime, Amazon Prime. So I think there's something to be said about that. And one of the amazing parts about this and what I really respect with you, Oleg, is you're continuously challenging your status quo. You're continuously changing your brain. You're continuously changing the way your brain perceives your environment. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I think we take for granted until we lose it. I see this with patients who trust off for brain injuries and concussions. Their real world hasn't changed, but their interpretation of the real world has. Mm -hmm. And it becomes very scary, very difficult, and very complex and confusing. And so for those of you out there who are struggling or are finding difficulty in the challenges that you are in, know that you're growing. Know that this is an opportunity for you to change and be a better version of yourself. And no matter what you're being placed in, there are always ways to get out. And you have a great resource right here, this platform, this podcast, this story, what Oleg has created. And so everyone has a story to tell. And I'm a big believer that everybody should be sharing their story because if you can help one person, mm -hmm. it's worth it. Mm -hmm. How do you serve as a catalyst for that change in through your own personal perspective, what do you tell yourself? Is, are there specific questions? I'll give you an example. Whenever I face an adverse circumstance, which happens on a daily basis, that's just it's just part of life. The life we live. Exactly. And the question that I try and ask myself in those situations is, what am I here to learn? What is this here to teach me? And what is it showing me to what is it showing me that I haven't seen before? Do you have a frame framework of your own when it comes to maybe similar or different situations? Like how do you continue to stay in that growth mindset and make sure that you don't ever fall out of it? I think one of the things that I used early on is I use fear as fuel. I'm, I'm mm. still scared to speak. I'm still scared to put myself <laughs> out there. I'm still scared to put my name Welcome on, to the club <laughs> yeah, on, on, on anything that I put out there, right? It's you're, you're vulnerable. You're showing people a piece of you that they may not have seen before, but I always try and use fear as fuel because it served me so well and getting me out of my comfort zone. It's so easy to be comfortable and we inherently love being comfortable. The brain doesn't want you to go out and, and take a, take a risk. That's yeah. inherently something that we fight against from a psychological standpoint. When we were not in this developed, you know, modern civilization that we were in, that served you very well. That way you wouldn't get killed. That way you wouldn't get eaten by a tiger or some sort of predator out there that would find you vulnerable if you're outside the cave or if you weren't protected by something. And so we still have that hardwired kind of thought process in, 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 the, in the back part of our, of our psyche. I mean, our brains haven't changed in, in millions of years, yet here we are living in the 21st century with all of these stimuli and influences and factors that we've never encountered before. And we have had no time to adapt or to try and figure out a way to change or you know overcome this, this default setting of ours. So I've had to purposely put myself in situations where I sign up for things and I'm in way over my head and I just figure it out. I've had to put myself in situations where I do a lecture. And I'm like, wow, this is in front of 500 people. This is a new thing for me. I'm scared, but I have to rise to the occasion and I have to make it happen. And when I do, that's my new plateau. I, I, I elevate my ceiling on purpose by putting myself in vulnerable situations. And most of them turn out to be perfectly fine. <laughs> are, there, are there some where I'm like, well, like that wasn't very good? Yeah, absolutely. And those are the ones I always remember, but um, I haven't died yet. Right. And so for me, I've I've lived through every single one of those. Um, and I use that as more of a driver for me to say, well, what else is left? What's the best version of me? What what am I going to grow up to be when I get older? And like I said, I don't know if I'll ever figure that out, but I'll spend the rest of my life trying to. And hopefully I can have a positive impact on people throughout that process as well. Otherwise, that's selfish of me to not give my gift to the world. Mm -hmm. And it's selfish of me not to share what I've experienced or what I think I know even if it's right or wrong, things that I may say today might be wrong next week, next month, next year, five years from now. I'm okay with that. And I'll own that. I, as long as I'm always learning and continuously growing, that's the best part about that. Mm -hmm. 
you mentioned something and you mentioned this on the other podcast when we're recording this concept of remembering the negative memories compared to the positive ones. Why is it like that? Why is it that in many situations, and I, I can't speak for everyone, but it seems that some or maybe many of us recall the negative ones at a significantly longer period of our lives rather than the positive ones. Yeah. Um, inherently, it's, it's, it's to a point how we're wired. Um, there are fear sensing centers in our brain, specifically a, a chunk of tissue called your amygdala that is um, always on alert. It's always scanning your environment and, and taking this information, this barrage of information that you're always getting that you sometimes take for granted until you lose it once again. It's always understanding and trying to figure out if, if there's something going on. And we remember things that are negative far more than positive because they have a significant impact on our survival. That's probably the easiest thing to say about that. Um, when you get into some of the um, studies within like psychology and psychiatry, um, you know, media companies have been doing this for, for decades. They've been using scare tactics and fear and negative news stories and all of these different emotional drivers for uh, trying to get views and people to read these articles. Um, there's a reason why you don't see a positive news network out there right now is because it wouldn't sell, no matter how well-intentioned it is. And I, I would like to think that there's an opportunity to do that, but, um, you know, it, it hasn't been done yet and it's 2021. I mean, why, why not? There, there are continuously people who are challenging that, that stature and that norm. And I think that it needs to, but unfortunately what we've found out, and there are some really good books that are written on this too. I forget, um, a text that I read, but you, we, from a, from a fear sensing perspective, you put somebody in an MRI machine and you have them read a news story that's positive or negative. The negative news story is going to have more of, of, of a neurological effect on their psyche and their perspective than a positive news story will. And um, unfortunately, once again, we have some hardwired uh, neurological pathways that served us well when we we're hunter gatherers and we we're out not being protected with modern society and our brains haven't evolved that much since then. So, we, we still have that wiring. I think that's one of the reasons why I inherently have to put myself in situations to overcome that. If I didn't, then I wouldn't. If I didn't sign up for this, this platform, I didn't, if I didn't connect with you and reach out to you randomly through a mutual connection of ours, then I probably wouldn't. Right. And I don't know what could come of that. And so, but once again, the, the conversation starts with putting yourself in vulnerable situations. Rich, Richard Branson, uh, who recently you know, went to space, the first billionaire to go to space, which is so cool. Um, one of his quotes that I love was, if you have an opportunity or if somebody asks you to do something and you don't think you can do it, say yes and figure out how to do it later. And I love that. And that's clearly served him well. I don't think that everyone's going to be a billionaire who just says yes to everything that they're asked. But if you have something that you want to pursue, let's say this is a job or a career or even a business opportunity and you don't know how to do it, but you have the opportunity to say yes to it, say yes to it and then figure it out and ask people to help you and bring together a group or a team of people who can be there to support you, whether you hire them or whether they're mentors or whether they're family members and then figure it out because that's what everyone has done before you. Jeff Bezos didn't know exactly what Amazon was going to look like when he started it, even with him being a very well, uh, regarded highly intellectual uh, and educated individual, he figured it out. He, he built the airplane as he flew it, as, as they would say. Mm -hmm. And I think more, more of us need to go about uh, living our lives like that because you just don't know what your potential could be. And that, that drives me every day is to figure out what is, what is the best version of me and how can I get to him as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Now you do a lot of this through nobody studios, right? I do. Yep. So um, with Nobody Studios, we are a venture studio based out of Orange County, California. And uh, as the co-founder of Health and Wellness, our goal is to radically transform and change the way we build startups in the health and wellness space. Uh, we are very passionate about mental health, addiction, workplace health and wellness. At some point, we'll get into medical device. And really, our goal as a studio is to build 100 people first, positively impacting companies in the next five years which is an absolutely audacious goal. But I know that we're going to be very close, if not over the amount of companies that we're going to create, because we have an amazing team of people who are working with us. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, the, the reason we're a venture studio is because as a venture studio, we have both venture capital wing and incubation wing. So the VC wing, classic VC component, 
uh, supplying capital to companies, helping them with fundraising, getting them off the ground and helping them, you know, do their thing. The beautiful part of that is you have to, you know, have the money, right? But then also too, you have to find companies that are willing to say, hey, we want, we want your help. The incubation side is kind of like us bringing in our own personal in-house Y Combinator. We are ideating and creating and and trying to innovate different business ideas to disrupt different industries. And so uh, the nice part about that is not only are we funding our own startups, but more importantly too, uh, we are a diverse group of individuals within the studio. So yes, I'm the co-founder of Health and Wellness, but we have people who are helping us ideate and innovate in fintech, in real estate, in social media. We have companies that are coming up in the um, like uh, media pay, media like um, categories for like recording music. And um, there, there are so many different facets that we have within the studio. We're just such a diverse studio. Um, and one of the reasons we built it that way is that we're a people first company. We want people to not only invest in what we're doing, but we want them to psychologically invest in what we're doing. We want them to be passionate about what the companies that we're building. We want them to have influence and give us feedback on the companies that we're creating. Like I said earlier, there's no point in me trying to reinvent the VCR if nobody wants it. So yes. we're not going to spend money and resources and raise capital to do that. I want to know what people have for pain points right now. I want to create a company to solve that pain point, give them a higher quality of life while also creating a profitable and sustainable business. And uh, we're in the middle right now of starting a uh, public crowdfunding um, campaign where people, you know, traditionally with a VC, you'd have to be a relatively high net worth individual to even be involved in a VC. And a VC selectively chooses which companies it wants to invest in, whereas investing in nobody's studios, as a venture studio, you can invest and you can get in for $5. $10, $100, $500, $1,000. There's no, there's no, you know, minimum, and I'll say relatively, there's a maximum, but there's no minimum for you to get involved with the company. And the beauty of that is when you're invested in the studio, you're invested in every single one of the companies that we create as well. And this is a radically different way to create companies and start ideating in this space is that we are bringing together so many different people who have so many different specialties to mash them together to try and see what we come up with. And uh, we have about 10 or 12 companies right now in 2021 that we'll be bringing to market. And I can tell you uh, it's going to be an absolute roller coaster to see what we come up with uh, and how these companies start evolving because we have so much traction already. And most of them aren't even publicly known or have any public following whatsoever outside of our investors and the individuals who've brought inside to the studio. So it's an exciting time and um, I'm grateful just to be along for the ride. We have a ton of opportunities ahead of us. And as you and I were talking as well too, Oleg, I think it's just time to change the way we do things. And I'm a firm believer of that. So I think actions speak louder than words and I'm willing to put um, my money where my mouth is and, and, and go and take a massive action to make that happen. Yeah. I'm a huge believer in that. I, th I think if anything, I've, what I've learned is that there's a difference between trying to control the outcome as a friend of mine, Lachelle Atkins would say, getting, being married to the outcome. I think there's a difference between that and there's a difference between putting in the work and just letting it happen, letting, letting, it take its own course. And I think if anything else, what I've learned throughout my own experience is that everything truly does have its own timing. Yeah. I, I try to influence it in so many different ways and I still catch myself doing it on a daily basis. But I think sometimes it's just that it's the consistency being put behind, whether it's challenging yourself, whether it's challenging your own concept of success and surrounding yourself with people who view the world similar, but also different according to how you see it. There's beauty in that. So I just, I appreciate you for sharing this space, bringing all those insights to light. And there's something to be said about the people, or maybe in this case, the person that even connected us, Scott yeah. Mason. He's yeah. also a guest on this, but there's something to be said about people like that who are constantly redefining what it means to be successful to them. And it influences people like us. Because now we're left questioning, well, what does success look like for me? And that's such a powerful question that should always be evolving with an answer. And Scott's a great example of that with his career of where he's gone, being an attorney, being an entrepreneur, growing and changing and challenging his own beliefs. Um, you know, he's walked that line. And so he's a great person to use as a mentor and as a peer to, to say, if he can do it, why not me? 
And that's how I look at a lot of people who've been successful and whatever your defi- definition of success means is, is your, your, your avatar, right? You know, I look at people who I value and I look up to and I'm like, if they can do it, why can't I? Yeah. And there's nobody stopping you from answering the question, but you. Yeah. It's as simple. And is it, it's, as complex as that all in one second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I appreciate you. I appreciate you for being a part of this. And for anyone that's listening, please connect with him through Nobody Studios. Do you have any other ways that people can connect with you? Yeah, I'm on I'm on Instagram. You just find Dr. Eric Reese. Um, and um, I'm going to be doing a lot more podcasting promos and, and, and just kind of getting the word out about the, the fundraising campaign that we're having with Nobody Studios. Our goal is to get as many people a part of the company as possible. <clears throat> and like I said earlier, you know, this doesn't have to be something where you're putting your life savings into it, although you can if you want to. I'm, I'm really hedging a bet on my skill set and the people that I've surrounded myself with. And we have a phenomenal team of people from mm-hmm. uh, Microsoft and uh, all of these great companies that have come before us where they're, you know, our chief innovation officers, um, uh, Barry O'Reilly and Donald Farmer, they're both, Barry O'Reilly was, uh, He's written many books on uh, startup methods, kind of like what Eric Reese wrote with the Lean Startup. Barry's written a couple mm-hmm. books. Consultant in Silicon Valley. Our CEO, Mark McNally, was uh, part of a very large um, uh, company that went public with the dot-com era. And Mark's got 14 startups under his belt. It's just a, a, a madman in the startup space who's had massive success. Um, Donald Farmer was a part of Microsoft for about 14 years. Uh, close confidant of um uh, Bill Gates at, at one point and um, the team that we've established and created are second to none, even Sagel. Sagel's phenomenal. And she's an attorney who has completely changed her career around. And now she is just a huge asset to our company because we're creating culture from day one. We're not hoping that our culture is created inherently. These people are brilliant, but they're willing to ask the hard questions. And I think that's one of the things that I love about this is that we are having conversations where we don't agree on everything. And we can still go to lunch afterwards. We can still tell each other we care about each other. And to agree and disagree, to push the agenda forward is something that's so powerful that I think really needs to be cultivated from day one, whether it's a personal or professional relationship or in the startup space as well, too. So um, I can't speak highly enough about what we're creating. And uh, I hope uh, if people have questions, they can reach out and find us and uh, get on board with our with our um, our crowdfunding campaign. That's amazing. Well, I I applaud what you're doing and respect you for who you are and just appreciate you for everything that you've shared and brought to the table today. So just thank you. Thank you for being you. Well, that is a two-way street there, sir. So I can't thank you enough for what you're doing. And, um, you know, it's been been great to to get to know you better as well. But what you've created in this platform is something that is very unique. And so those who are listening, um, you know, don't take this for granted. This is something that that can change your life. And I hope that it does.